your imagination can often be a, an enemy to your practice. You can imagine that it's impossible to gain results, or you can imagine all the good things that might happen if you break the precepts or don't meditate tonight. Or you could just sit here creating all kinds of imaginary worlds to entertain yourself or torment yourself, as the case may be. But it's not so much that imagination is bad, it's simply you don't know how to use it. There's a Pali term, Bhattipana, which can be translated as imagination, ingenuity, inventiveness. And this, the Buddha said, is a positive element in the path. In fact, when he talks about the qualities you should know about yourself as you gauge how far you've come in the path, the skill with which you use your bhatipana or imagination is one of the things that you should notice and try to develop in a skillful direction. Classically, it means taking what you've already learned and learning how to develop new ideas, new approaches from that, approaches that are skillful, ways of thinking that are skillful. Because the Buddha doesn't lay everything out in the suttas. Sometimes he'll make passing references to things, and you have to fill in the blanks yourself. This is a, an important element in your bhatipana, your imagination. And John Mahabua talks about this a lot, too. He, in one of his talks about his various approaches for dealing with pain, he says he would come up with an approach one night that would work really well, and then he'd try it again the next night and it wouldn't work at all, which meant that he had to keep manufacturing new approaches, trying to figure out exactly what's the problem tonight, what's the difference tonight from last night and involved experimenting and finding that not every everything he would imagine or come up with was going to work, but every now and then he would find something that would work. And this is an attitude you have to take toward the practice. You have to be willing to experiment. You have to be willing to fail so you can learn from your failure. The type of practice that wants everything guaranteed from the beginning. I'll do this and nothing bad will ever happen. That's an unrealistic attitude. When they talk about not being attached to outcome, it means that you're willing to test things and if something doesn't work out, you admit that it doesn't work out, but that doesn't mean you just leave it at that. You try to figure out what went wrong and then try to come up with a new solution. That story I tell him, John Fuang. getting his orders from John Lee to go down and move that cornerstone under the ordination hall. And John Fung didn't see how it was going to work, and sure enough, they tried various ways of moving it the next day. None of them worked at all. But when John Fung went back to talk to John Lee about this, he didn't just go and say, well, we failed, and leave everything up to John Lee. And he, in the meantime, had tried to come up with a solution on his own. That's important. When things don't work out, you try to figure out, well, what would work? And you give that a try. Because it's not just one way that things are going to work in the mind. Because the mind doesn't have just one set of defilements. It has lots of different defilements. Greed, aversion, and delusion can come in 108 different ways, and maybe 108 is too small a number. And if you want to just memorize a few principles and hope that just memorizing those few things will take care of everything. They're going to eat you up. You've got to be willing to come up with new ideas on your own. When you stop thinking about your imagination, there are basically four functions. 
One is the ability to picture something, and then the next is the ability to hold that picture in your mind. And the third is the ability to make changes in the picture, and the fourth is the ability to evaluate it. And as a good meditator, you need all four kinds of functions. Think up something and then hold it in mind, and then run a few tests on it. And some of the tests you can do in your imagination first. And if you see that something's not going to work at all, you can discard it. But then there are other things that seem to work okay in your imagination. That's when you actually put them to the test in your practice. This principle applies both to dealing with negative things that come up, learning how to say no to your bad habits, and learning how to say yes to potential good habits that you ordinarily might not be able to imagine yourself doing. You need to use your imagination both ways. When you're saying no to an addiction, you have to be able to imagine yourself sticking with that determination. And if there's part of the mind that tries to undermine that, you have to imagine ways of dealing with that. You can't let yourself just get shot down quickly, the way you have been in the past. And if it seems too big a thing to make a vow that forever and ever and ever you're never going to break, say, any one of the precepts. What's wrong with saying, well, just every time the issue comes up, I'll deal with it firmly. Because it's not going to be forever and ever. It's not going to be you're tempted to break a precept in 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. The temptations come and go. And so you make a vow that, okay, when they come up, I'll be able to say no. I'll make that a law inside my mind. And if the the temptation seems persistent. You say, well, why can't I be more persistent? Because what is the temptation but one part of your mind? So why can't another part of your mind be just as persistent, just as insistent, just as tenacious? Learn how to imagine that. And if the temptation comes up with different arguments, you've got to be able to counteract, <coughs> counter the arguments. Use your imagination for that. Don't give in easily. As for the positive things, yes, imagine that you will be able to gain an awakening. This path will work, and it will work for you, and you'll make it work. And if the mind comes up with obstacles, well, remember that's part of your imagination right there, the obstacles it creates. And one of the things you have to be able to do is change the obstacle comes up with this objection, come, you come back with a counter-objection. Or you examine exactly how far does that objection go, how true is it. And you may say, well, in the past I've always been weak and wavering and I've never been able to make anything of myself. And well, what's motivating that? It's the unwillingness to put yourself out a little bit more. And do you want to stay weak and wavering that way for the rest of your life and on to other lives? No. You say, well, I can change. That may be a step-by-step-by-step -step -step process. So learn how to imagine it as step-by-step. -step. And then learn how to encourage yourself when you have made a step. In other words, learn how to use your patipana, use your imagination and ingenuity as aids on the path. Because we're using our imagination all the time. It's part of the anticipation that gives rise to states of becoming in the mind. We anticipate that a particular thought world is going to be fun, so you create it. And if you don't like your creation, well, you change it here and you change it there a little bit, and then you get in and you ride. And if you can do that with unskillful things, why can't you do it with skillful things? 
right concentration is a state of becoming, and the anticipation that you're going to be able to do it is an important part of being able to actually do it, to learn how to use your imagination in that way. Pains come up, and the old techniques you've worked that have worked for you in the past don't work this time. Well, that doesn't mean this is an impossible pain. It means it's simply a, a different kind of pain, or the the clinging that's creating the problem around the pain, the craving that's creating the problem around the pain. It's slightly a different kind of clinging or craving. So use your imagination. And the Buddha talks about knowing your imagination as you pair it with your learning. Think of what you've learned in the past, what the Buddha had to say about how suffering comes from clinging to any one of the five aggregates. Which aggregate are you clinging to? His terms of analysis are meant to be food for your imagination, to open up possibilities. Maybe you think of the pain simply as a physical thing, but remember, it's, it's a feeling, and the feeling is connected with perceptions and it's connected with thought constructs. What kind of thoughts are you constructing around the pain? What kind of perceptions are you applying to the pain? What exactly is the feeling? How does the feeling differ from the body, the physical part? The body is the four elements. The, the feeling is something else. The perception is something else. We tend to glom all these things together, but he's giving you food for thought. So the teachings are there not only as a description of the path, but also as an incitement to the path, food for your imagination. So this quality of bhatipana, your imagination, your ingenuity, your inventiveness. Can actually become a help rather than a hindrance. <laughs>